Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Franco Baya. I'm from the University of Michigan, and I'm going to give you uh, some samples of what has worked well for us. Our lab is called SUS. It stands for Setabot Equivalent Ultra Short Pulse Laser System. I know this is a mouthful, and uh, I'm not going to go into the science, but more on, of course, the project management side. So in this presentation, I'm going to give you over management techniques that worked well for us as well as uh, performance metrics, and in particular, metrics that we actually tailored to uh, the situation, first of all, for us as a team, but then also uh, I'm using the example of procurement and capital for capital equipment, in particular optics and vacuum equipment, and where we tailored uh, metrics to our suppliers. Uh, I'm going to then also uh, go a little bit into our performance measurements for our own internal team, what we used, what has worked well, and in the end I'm going to give you a summary. Um, about the project, a very brief overview. Uh, we are a pulse laser system and SUS uh, will have uh, a 3 petawatt uh, 25 femtosecond dual beam line. This is uh, from a high peak power, the highest peak power in the US for research. We will be operational in about three months. So we are truly in the commissioning phase at the end of the project. And for uh, the most important part is that we will be an NSF user facility, which is uh, very exciting for us. And 70% of our uh, time will be for external users. And our year one, we did complete a call for proposal. We have six years, uh, six experiments uh, scheduled for the first year. Uh, this uh, provides a very brief overview. And uh, on the bottom, you see for, uh, over a hundred linear feet of optical tables uh, with amplification stages, optics. I have a couple of real pictures in there. Uh, and we have uh, three, three target areas. And in the middle, you see the clean room. And in these beam lines, you see that there is a tremendous, you will see a tremendous amount of vacuum equipment. We have uh, also optics within the equipment as well as on the optical tables. From a timeline perspective, as I mentioned, we are uh, at the end of a, our four year construction project. So we are in the midst of our qualification phase and we completed all these steps up front, uh, the design, procurement, the installation, and uh, we are very excited that we can start the operation in the fall. Uh, for, for all of you who are not familiar with uh, physics uh, and uh, in particular with the equipment needed to conduct our experiments, um, the key components that we are faced with is we have to design vacuum equipment. You see these vast amount of steel chambers, for instance, in the center of the target chamber is almost 300 inches long. We have optics in the size of 170 millimeters and every single piece of equipment uh, was customized. The key for us in this uh, item is that those items being customized had all, of course, high cost and very, very, very long lead time. At the beginning of the project, we were, of course, interrupted with uh, the COVID quarantine. And with the methods we used, despite the uh, uh, quarantine, we actually are on time to our original dates that we had. And here in this uh, slide, I summarized uh, the, the approach that we took. Um, approximately 70% of our entire funding is for capital equipment. So it's a very capital intensive uh, uh, project. We currently have over 900 purchase orders for capital equipment to 68 suppliers. However, when we looked at uh, the approach that we took is high cost and long lead items that concentrated uh, the funding over eight suppliers 20 purchase orders compared to over 600 and 75% of our entire funding. And that was, of course, from a project management perspective where we spent all our time on because uh, all the other ones, uh, when they were light, they were light. Of course, we tracked them, but uh, the majority of our regular updates and what you will see in the metrics that we used uh, was used for those suppliers. And from the uh, uh, project management methods, um, 
The one item that uh, we wanted to show here, and I showed a couple of uh, the scales, is what helped us very early, early on in our design phase is to have a very precise uh, scope of work. The prior projects often had elements where we said, yeah, we would like to design, for instance, steel chambers with you. We went a different route. Our uh, 3D prints were very, very close to what's called manufacturing shop floor prints. So while you might not be able to run the floor, it wasn't far away from it. And that helped us actually, number one, getting a better price, better timing, and it helped us manage the instance. So we have here, uh, for instance, I uh, mentioned a mirror mount. That's the part that holds our optics. Uh, the design that we provided, the fabricators for the quote is down here. And on the right side, you see uh, the assembled version of it. And in terms of lead time, we had uh, the prior projects almost three months. And these ones we can build now in two to four weeks. The uh, other items that I wanted to uh, mention here is um, we had a format that we did not change. We kept our format, and this was in form of PowerPoint presentations. PowerPoint presentations helped us in the sense that we were very able to highlight very quickly any changes and communicate the changes because people were used to seeing what they see. They knew exactly the charts that we were using. They understood the numbers, the scales, or the summary and key points. I have a couple of examples of those as well in the presentation. And uh, the one item that we requested from our vendors, which is very similar, of course, what we are asked uh, by the NSF, is uh, that in our initial project kickoff meetings, we told all our key suppliers that they have to display schedule contingencies. They cannot hide those in the manufacturing process. That made them, of course, very nervous, but we told them we will work through this together because the one emphasis that we had is that we wanted to develop a partnership with the vendors versus a purely commercial agreement, and that helped us in openness and transparency to manage uh, the issues as they arose. So here I just wanted to show very briefly a chart, uh, and this is a combination of a, a, a report. You see in the bottom uh, a very, very detailed process flow, and by, uh, to be honest, uh, I kept the print very small because the steps aren't the important part, but what I wanted to highlight here is this was for a optic supplier. The optic supplier had very, very uh, scientific, detailed technical skill sets. So the process of how to make our optics was very clear, and the boxes represent the individual optics where they are in the manufacturing stages because they went through multiple loops. So that was very helpful. But uh, the top scale is the best, um, let me say it this way, uh, gain chart that we were able to retrieve from them. And it is, from a project management perspective, uh, something that we, of course, could have done a little bit more detail. But it was very cumbersome for those supplies because they were very small. Their uh, personnel was predominantly former professors that started the companies that making optics because the skill was so technical. Uh, so what we found with those suppliers is that um, project management side is something that they could uh, use help from. But once we had a format, here you see even the big pink area, the process delays when certain items weren't uh, up to our specifications. And those delays we managed together versus just waiting and seeing. So here's another example, of course, very uh, familiar probably. It's a uh, Microsoft project chart. Uh, this is from a manufacturing side. So that supplier had very, it's a steel fabricator. Uh, he was making a uh, magnet cluster for us. And that was something that was used. Um, I just wanted to briefly go through a little bit what worked for us. Um, our agenda in our project management meetings followed the WBS structure. We never deviated from it. That helped us to com uh, generate a continuity in our agenda, in our reviews, in our reporting to the NSF. And here's, for instance, one of the laser assembly summaries, again, chart that we used. As you can see in the far left, uh, down to level four, WBS number and the status to it. And then we summarized, in this case here even, uh, this is a current one that we're looking for, is uh, what we defined what is the critical path. And that is the important part because the critical path is true interdependencies. If you track 
in your Gantt chart something that doesn't have two interdependencies, you'll struggle and spend a lot of time. So those are the things, and very simple, and that is something. And then here, I just wanted to have uh, one last uh, summary slide uh, in terms of the approach that we took again. Uh, the key for us uh, was really transparency and the data-driven approach. We called our, told our suppliers, please don't tell me, because they wanted to verbally explain in meetings, but nothing uh, to show. And we said, you need to please show us the data. So with that, I'm at the end of my presentation. And of course, I wanted to make sure that uh, we uh, mentioned uh, that this was, of course, a team effort. So thank you. I'm told I have to wait until the slide changes. <laughs> but while we wait, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. Uh, my name is Brittany Todd. I am a project manager and also do operations at the Renaissance Computing Institute at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, I am the lead project manager for Fabric. So I'll go ahead and tell you a little bit about Fabric um, and then dive into what we did in terms of project management and some lessons learned. So Fabric is an NSF uh, mid-scale research infrastructure, one uh, that empowers researchers to securely prototype um, and also validate disruptive designs um, in an environment that closely emulates real systems that computational scientists use today. And so Fabric can be thought of as like a scientific instrument, also uh, a laboratory that enables experimentation uh, with new paradigms for distributed applications and internet protocols. Um, and this is uh, able to run across and within the network. Uh, we too have a great team. Um, we were funded by the NSF in uh, 2019, and we are currently about to complete our construction phase in September. Um, following construction, we will enter an operational phase. Um, despite this, uh, Fabric has actually been partially open starting last year, and we've been able to gain users and also experimentation on the platform. Uh, Fabric is led by Ilya Balden, he's the PI, um, and we have five core institutions that we work with, UNC being one of them, RNC, uh, Kentucky, um, ESNet, which you heard a lot from Ender today, he helped inform a lot of our project management efforts as well, UIUC, um, and then Clemson. We also have 17 subcontractors that we work with that helped uh, build the different uh, sites. Fabric partners with dozens of different campuses and organizations uh, to help support early testing and evaluation, as well as federation with a number of existing test beds and CI infrastructures. So this is the, the topology of fabric. Just so you get an idea of the scope, we do have 33 sites that we had to build uh, that were both domestic and international. It has a connection to CERN, University of Bristol, University of Amsterdam, and University of Tokyo. That's our international footprint, as well as a South American connection through Amlite, through FIU. Uh, the domestic efforts is funded under Fabric, and then our international efforts are funded under an IRNC grant called Fabric Across Borders, FAB. Um, and so having this large footprint requires managing a lot of different complexities, including shipping the different hardware, um, different uh, international taxes and customs and all those types of things that you run into. And in addition, with our subcontractors, we have to manage a bunch of different partnerships. Uh, these include supercomputing centers, uh, university campuses, mid-skill test beds, like I mentioned, things like Chameleon and Cloud Lab, um, and then also large facilities, so places like TAC and NCSA. So we have to kind of manage those relationships as well. We have, like I said, because we've been open for um, about a year, or at least just getting into that, we do have a community that we are building. Um, it includes hundreds of users uh, and also 75 projects across 100 different organizations. 
And our knit workshops is one of the main ways that we bring that community together. It's not the only way, but it's a big way that we do, which of course we uh, run. And so we help them, people learn through tutorials and meet members of the different communities um, for new members and also existing members to be able to share what their experiments are on fabric. So for the project management side of things, how do we manage all of this? Uh, we do use Agile EVM. So I was one of those people that raised my hand when he talked about Agile. Uh, it tail we tailored basically the earn value management side of things um, to meet specific requirements, but then also uh, used Agile and an ability to compare current work planned against actual work planned. Um, I think it's important to note that we started in 2019. I think we were part of the first cohort. And as it's been said many times today, things have definitely evolved and I think improved as we've learned together with the NSF. And so some of the things that we implemented and were required of our project today probably aren't as necessary or required. Um, now, but be, uh, we did focus, of course, a lot on you know identifying subtasks within our WBS. And something that I've noticed that may be different is that our WBS level project uh, was level zero, and then we had one, two, and three, and then that we reported on, and then added additional granularity for level four. Um, so pretty detailed. We. Valued communication, we were um, similar to what my colleague here said, weekly talking with the leadership team. We met bi-weekly uh, with the NSF, and then we used Google Drive, GitHub, Jira, Slack to kind of manage those day-to-day -day communications. Our reporting was actually quarterly, which sounds different than some of you that I've heard um, out there, uh, which I think was great. And it also helped us correspond or correlate our risk register review with that quarterly report. So unlike many of you, we did not do that on a monthly uh, frequency. And I think you'll hear later, that's actually something that I think benefited our project. Um, and then of course we had an annual NSF report. Some key metrics uh, that we focused on are those key performance parameters. We did use uh, a similar structure that Ender talked about earlier today with the threshold and the optimal metrics. And then we had to be very specific with the NSF on what EVM metrics we were going to use um, because we are starting this agile concept that was they weren't as familiar with. And so um, if you have any questions about that, I can go into more details maybe later about what, how we decided what was going to be put in. But one of the big things is we actually did not use story points. Um, we did instead like compare the total number of tasks completed to the total number of tasks added or removed from each release. And that was because we felt like the tasks um, were more specific and story points are an estimate of time. And so we felt like it wasn't, we weren't able to report on the actual status of what was going on if we were going to use that. Um, and last, one thing that we found really helpful was actually defining the scope of the workshop past just the frequency. So instead of saying we'll do two a year, we said we did two a year, there's gonna be X amount of people attending and we really detailed it out. And later, as we became more popular um, and started doing in-person post-COVID, it really helped us stay in scope with that workshop because um, we had that scope defined. Some lessons learned. Um, as I just mentioned, defining scope and using our mythology, the adding deliverables within the WBS, most of them had it uh, right built in and that helped us be able to easily report on that. Um, we also, this was a conversation today, change log, change control board. We opted to use a decision log um, for and scoped that um, within the W or the PEP. And so we explained that we we're primarily going to use this tool that required less overhead. And then for these few exceptions, we will be using a more formal process. And that worked really well for us. Uh, I've touched on the Agile EVM already. Reporting um, ongoing WBS tasks. So, oh, I'll skip because I think I'm running out of time here, but subcontractor actuals. This was something that was really difficult for us in the beginning because different institutions run on different frequencies and timelines for reporting. Um, and so what we ended up doing is having um, 
to use more cumulative data based on invoices instead of what they're reporting in a quarterly time frame because we just weren't able to get all of the information from them at that frequency. This is also true with the hardware. So um, a lot because of COVID, but in general, when we spent hardware costs, it's not charged until after it's shipped. And that can take up to 11 months later and then go through a 30 to 60 day processing. So basically you could go a year from when you order a piece of hardware into actually it being captured in your EVM metrics. And so we added layers of reporting so that when you see, hey, you've only spent 50% of your budget, but you're 90% complete, it lines up better. Um, so we used obligated funds. Um, the, I have a couple more things here, but I think I might be out of time. Uh, so if you have any questions, I'd love to talk to you more about what we've learned. If you're interested more about fabric as well, we have these opportunities here that you can learn more about. And that's it. Thanks. <laughs> All right, we'll just wait for the slides to show up. <laughs> In the meantime, I'm Jeanette Jackson. Um, I'm at the University of Michigan, and I manage the Research Data Ecosystem Project, which is an MSRI2. Um, and oh, voila, OK. So this is a project. We are modernizing the software platform for ICPSR, which is a mouthful. Um, and it is the world's largest social science data archive. It's located at the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan. So we are taking a platform and making it be more modern, flexible, all those things. I feel like um, the presentation, you, your colleague, um, Indir Esnet, I felt like mini-me. My team and I were sitting there thinking, this is, oh, thank you for saying this. It just made, validated us, made us feel like, okay. This is, this is, we are experiencing some similar things. Um, in addition to modernizing the platform, we are also going to be building tools for the research community. So these are tools that are gonna help with metadata. These are tools that are gonna help with keeping research documents together. Um, that's kind of coming a little bit after we finish the software platform modernization. So we have sort of two distinct pieces of this project. We've got, um, four uh, software development teams and multiple projects running throughout. Um, so I was asked to talk, I should let you know, I'm a year and a half in, or I should say we are a year and a half in to this work. So we're a little bit at the front end. Um, and I was asked to talk a little bit about our PEP development approach. So at the start, when from the moment that we knew we needed a PEP, we had six weeks to complete it. At that time, we had heavy faculty input. We did do an all hands on deck throughout the university, pulled in you know project management, finance grants, whatever we could. Um, and I tapped into my knowledge network, the National Organization of Research Development Professionals, because a lot of um, chatter is on that on those channels about um, NSF infrastructure projects and was connected to a couple of former um, program managers for NSF, and one of whom became, I think he was the director of LFO for a short time. Anyway, and I just remember saying, okay, so if there's any advice, what, do you, what would you tell me? And the one thing he said to me was, hire a master scheduler. Now, I need to say something here, because um, in terms of being inclusive, uh, master scheduler doesn't go over very well. So we are calling our scheduler the integrated scheduler. Um, and I just kind of want to put that out there because there was a note about being more inclusive at NSF. So saying that. Um, that was followed by two years of iteration, maybe more. And it moved from a faculty-led proposal to an expert research-led research proposal. Um, so there was an intensive uh, planning, replanning and estimation. We hired an estimating consulting firm. We hired someone who knew more about EVM because at that time, our, our determination was that we needed to do EVM, even though I'm not sure we actually really needed to. There was a little bit of ambiguity at that time. But because we said we were doing it, we were kind of committed to it. Um, at, and that's, that's what we understood was what we had to do. Uh, we also had really good guidance from the NSF folks who were helping us by asking questions and helping us to um, improve the PEP. 
So PEP lessons learned involving the experts who will do the work. The buy-in is huge. The accuracy is much better. We used graphics to keep the work on track. Um, those two graphics that you saw at the beginning of the, the presentation, we kept bringing those back to remind people that we're building this re research data superhighway so that we can make it a coherent experience for p researchers working with social science data. Um, Taking the time to translate the institutional finance into this NSF process, I think if we'd spent more time on that, we may have made a different determination or been able to advocate more um, for not doing EBM. Um, and then we made our PEP document easy to, to navigate from the start with lots of hot links. And find an NSF project manager friend. So my friend here, Franco, <laughs> has been helping us from the start. And there's nothing like having a phone a friend. Um, for project management methods, um, our biggest uh, job in the past year and a half, we are now just fully staffed. Uh, much like um, SNET, we tripled in size. So we have hired over 30 people. And we were hiring during COVID. And we were hiring when it was really hard to get software developer engineers um, to come and work for academic salaries. So it was, we had to get really creative, which we did, and I can talk more about that later. Um, we also had to select the tools that we were gonna use. So there was a lot of push to use Microsoft Project, but our team didn't work with my Microsoft Project. So we had to use something that would work for them. So we, just, we chose Smartsheets. We used Jira, um, we used GitLab, Google Docs, um, much like your group, the, the Slack and Gchat. Um, an email we did have to at one point to make everybody go to slack because we had people checking slack and checking gchat and it was a mess um we also use miro and if you haven't used miro it's a really fun tool it's very visual um, all of our projects have boards where they have their software development process on miro and they can pull in from jira and put it right into miro um, in terms of the processes that we saw, so it was we had to develop tools, we had to develop processes. The potlucks to team check-ins. What that means is that in these each four software development teams, we have product owners, we have tech leads, we've got UX designers and engineers, and we've got DevOps. And those, that's the way the teams are organized. And so we have the lead for each one of those in those teams as their own unit, and we meet with them weekly or we did meet with them weekly, and it's kind of backed off to, to bi-weekly. So we had to determine the planning cycles that we need. At the beginning of COVID, the need for communication was huge. At one point, we had a 15-minute stand-up every day with our software team because we just needed to make sure we were hitting the blocks that, that were coming up and that people felt like they had a thread of what was going on. Um, uh, the rest of it is pretty straightforward, HR and hiring, financial check-ins, we do configuration. We have a very detailed configuration um, log th uh, that my colleague manages, and that's helping us to do some future risk planning because with software, so much of it is what are you building when, and we're building towards KPPs, but there's many different ways you can do it. And so we don't know actually what the implications are for the deadline until we actually get up to a certain point. But getting, getting an estimation of how long it takes, how, you know, how much you're adding in or taking out and then doing that, oh, never mind, doing it over time. It, anyway, it gives you a clue as to what's coming ahead. We also had leadership check-ins. We have subject matter experts, faculty that we have to manage and external um, and technical advisory boards. So lessons learned, it's all about the people. I mean, this has been such a huge, I mean, 90% of our budget is people. Um, so there's a lot of culture management, et cetera. EVM can be done with simple tools. Um, incorporating design into the software development process helps us to avoid building the wrong things. A security review at the beginning is really helpful. It's helping us to avoid issues that we know we, we could incur a lot of cost later had we not done that. And then documenting those decisions where everyone can see them has been something that is really important. Uh, lessons learned. Technical advisors who can actually put in some time, that's really important. Kelsey Hightower from Google, he doesn't charge us anything. And he comes in and he does these like technical chiropractic adjustments hmm, once or twice a year, which is what it seems to be. And he's fantastic. He just can zero right in on the issue. Um, CI Compass, that was the, the uh, Eva Diebelman. I, I'm sorry for not getting the right last name. Fantastic resource. 
they helped us do an encryption review of our encryption plans. We didn't have the expertise. We didn't know where to go. We just contacted them and boom. They set it up so that someone from, it was a team from the University of Notre Dame who helped us out. Um, the external advisory board, we're still working on how to maximize that value. So earned value management was our, is, our, is our management um, process. Um, our approach is to determine the value of the work before it starts. So to determine what of the work that's being done, how much value does that bring to the research data community of a team's entire work. So each team has its own sort of earned value management way of measuring, and then we roll it up. Uh, I think the rest is pretty straightforward. We also use regular comparing actuals to uh, baseline. I'm not sure we needed EVM, but EVM, we are using EVM to help focus on the value that we're creating, not just counting the number of stories done, like really trying to determine what are we producing that's of value and making sure we've got acceptance criteria around that. So lessons learned when you're modernizing an existing system, you're building the plane while flying it. This is what it looked like before. This is what it's going to look like after. And I would say lessons learned there that communication is intense when you're changing a system that already exists um, and you're really trying to build on top of it and replace it. Um, and then as, as time goes by, you know, so in COVID, we had to do very intense communication. Now it's too much. Now we have too many meetings. So we're pulling back and we're evaluating and looking at, we, you know, we're building last year, kind of up to this year. Now we're really codifying those processes. And that's all I have. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I feel like I'm up against the heavy hitting team up here. Holy moly. Um, wow, my slides came up quick. Uh, I, I, that's like the fastest ever. Uh, I'm Carrie Gonzalez. I am the project manager of the Niche Project. I'm not going to read all the words for you. It means niche. Um, it is a mid-scale one uh, project. We were awarded um, about a year and a half ago. Uh, it's a $12.8 million award. Uh, and essentially, I'm not going to get into the science at all. Uh, what niche is, is the, the mid-scale one part of niche is developing a design for what will be a full-scale facility to do hurricane uh hurricane testing, essentially natural hazard testing at, at hurricane levels. And by full scale, I mean a facility where we can build a two story structure inside a wind and wave tunnel. So this is not a small endeavor. That is the ideal. That's where we're headed with the niche design. That's what the ultimate outcome of this design uh, project is, this first part of the project under the Midscale One award. Um, so I have kind of a pretty picture here. You'll actually see this picture in a couple of other presentations this week uh, as it's it's a, an example of, a, of what you can do with Midscale One money to start with. Um, this is conceptual. This doesn't actually represent anything, but you can imagine a facility where there's a big wall of fans and a large wave uh, flume and you're, you, you know, just throwing things at a building and seeing what happens. Um, obviously, wind and wave testing is not new. It has been done. It's being done now in many different ways, but this would be the first of its kind facility to combine all of that together. Um, I should add, and my team would be very happy if I did, is that this facility is not only the physical. We also intend to bring in those parts that are what we call the non-physical um, workforce development, uh, convergent research uh, capacity for users to come in and have the, the full package where you can train your workforce with some online forums. You bring them in, you use the facility to its full extent. You're getting data out of it that actually can be used to forward. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You can you can forward like code changes for building structures and determine coastal resilience type factors and that type of thing that are related to natural hazards like hurricanes and tornadoes. We also intend to look at you know downburst simulations and that stuff that sort of thing. So that's the science of niche. Um, Oh, here you go. Here's my here's my slide on it. I, I left it on the pretty picture. Um, I, one of the key things about this project is that we're actually doing some construction in with the design, which could be a little bit different than what would be a classical design project. We're developing what we're calling a physical design test bed uh, and using several existing facilities, both wind only and wave only and wind wave 
combined facilities to do physical tests whereby we're going to prototype the plans for the design and use that information that we get from those physical tests to inform our design and tell us that the design's headed in the right direction. Um, in addition to that, we do have an external advisory board that's helping us with those types of determinations and reviews of what our plans are for that, uh, that part of it. Um, I, I talk a little bit up about the convergent research capacity here. From our perspective, uh, when I came in, the, the final deliverable for this mid-scale package is what we're calling review ready. What does that mean? Um, I think we just talked about this in the rig session. There's a bit of amb ambiguity about where you go with a mid-scale one, where does a mid-scale one end? So we've decided that for our project, mid-scale one actually ends at probably what would be like a PDR level, where we will have a full design package, that design is ready to be put in front of a technical review committee, uh, a project review committee, a combined committee to review that project from top to bottom to determine, is it ready for construction? Number one, could it be a mid-scale two project? Or on the flip side, is this such a large thing that we actually now need to jump into a more formal process for MREFC funding, whereby we have to do those, what did, what did uh, Steve call it, capital Ds on the, on the phase gates, where we have um, a, an actual PDR and a, and a final design review, and then we're looking at that big, that big dollar funding. Um, a big takeaway from, from this slide is going to be our team is nationwide. We have nine institutions, all university institutions, plus one commercial supplier that, ha that make up our team and that creates in and of itself a project management I don't want to say it's not a nightmare. It's a it's a project management challenge. Let's put it that way. Um, trying to organize meetings across time zones, trying to get everybody who needs to be in a particular set of meetings to agree to the meetings because, like in the COVID years, there are it, there is such a thing as too many meetings. People can't get things done because the meetings are happening. Um, so just a brief slide on our team. These are the different uh, institutions I, I talked about. If you're more interested about the science, you can hit the website on the, on the um, slides here and find out more about niche in general. So I, I wanted to take a little bit of a different tack. I, everybody I think here probably has an idea of what project management is, what project controls is, that kind of thing. I wanted to tell you sort of where I came from. Um, the niche project started without me. Uh, the, the, Initial PEP, the initial schedule work, the initial cost book um, analysis and development was all done by the folks at, at Florida International, which is where I, uh, I'm, I'm part of. I manage them, the team from the awarded institution. And they, they, they did a great job. They got the award. They made a very good case for this to be an NSF sponsored program. Um, so that being said, they did not have a perfect, they didn't have a project manager at all. Um, it was being led by their, uh, the FIU department's uh, co-director and the PI who did a very good job putting together what they did. They brought in some consultants, um, most notably uh, Carol Wilkinson, Mark Warner, uh, Bill McVeigh from Dash, to to look over what the PEP had in it and then to um, give some advice on how to, to you know move it along. They brought, what happened is the, the review of that turned into um, some questions from the program office. You know, we, it, they didn't have a good schedule built. They didn't have that kind of thing. So they needed to go out and look for a, a project manager. I can tell you, I'm not a natural hazard scientist. I have no background in natural hazards. I come from the telescope industry. I've built large facility telescopes for 20 years. I thought, wow, okay, you, you guys need a project manager. I can do project management, but I know nothing about your science. So my, my whole point of the slides here is there's not really a perfect project manager for everybody. Um, it, sometimes you have to select that not so perfect person. Um, I don't have those core competencies that they were looking for, uh, not the core competencies. I don't have the project specific stuff, the, the, the science related to natural hazards. I don't have the background in civil engineering. I don't have that. But what I do have have is some of those core competencies. Because I came from other large facility projects, I was exposed to the NSF ways. So I understood the terminologies that the NSF uses. Um, I understood uh, the need for reporting. I understood very clearly the need for a very rigorous EVM because I actually came from a very large facility. I, my, my history is on DKIST, the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope. 
So that being MREFC, we had a very rigorous EVM. Um, so I was familiar with that. I was familiar with those things. So while I didn't have that specific science background, I could bring to the table the things that were missing and let the scientists do their job. And I thought that was a really important part. And I think so far, I've only been on the project eight months, so <laughs> I'm, I'm still a newbie. I don't think I'm in my break-in period yet. Um, but, you know, it's, it's the, that type of thing where there's more cohesiveness with me not trying to dive into the science as much and just letting me do the project management part and take that that part away from the the PI and the co-PIs and all of that to get that kind of off of the off of their shoulders. So the next thing is so we did bring on PM consultants. We still have PM consultants. Um, the the key the next thing is so what about project controls? So <laughs> this one's huge. We are all academic institutions. All of them are very familiar with grants from the NSF and how to work at the grant thing, the Form 1030s, the submissions to the NSF. This ain't a grant. I hate to break it to you. An MSRI 1, MSRI 2, these aren't grants. These are projects with defined scope and deliverables that must be met by the NSF. The NSF is your customer. You have to satisfy your customer. You have to produce reports and information for your customer that are appropriate. Um, you are on a time limit. You can't keep the money. You know, if you get to the end and there's money left, guess what? The money has to go back. It can't be just there as a grant for in perpetuity for science. Um, I will say project management control absolutely required. Uh, like I said, we, we are currently using a pretty rigorous EVM such that I'm pretty sure if you took our project and plopped it into MREFC, it would not be a big step for us to get to that full um, credentialed EVM process just because I'm basing my history off of working from D with DKIST. Um, so to that extent, I, I appreciate the use of a good EVM, but I, I, I hear from my colleagues at the table that maybe it's not necessary in, in mid-scale, and, and that's probably true. I think for some projects it's not. You just have to actually answer the, the question, um, what are you doing next? You know, for us, we know we're going from this smallish design to a very large facility. In that perspective, in my perspective, a very a much more rigorous EVM is appropriate because you're training the people you're working with that that's what's coming. You're gonna have to do that level of rigor down the line. So um, let's see, I, I'm being told to wrap up. So lesson two and a half, manage expectations. Everybody's already said it, you know, keep your communications flowing. We have lots and lots of meetings, which some people gripe about. Um, I do hold cost account manager, control account manager meetings with my team once a month. I have pro, uh, meetings with the program office once a month at the NSF. Um, I, the most important thing for me has been, you know, meet your team. I'm remote. I actually don't work in Florida. I live in Arizona. So I remote completely. So most of my stuff has been very remote through Zoom, through things like that. Um, I'd say, you know, go meet your team. Get on a plane. Go visit. I'm excited. I'm here today. This week I get to meet Joy, Dr. Pauschke, who is our uh, program officer here at the NSF. And that's wonderful. I see her face on Zoom every month, which is great. So, um, but yeah, I, that's that's kind of my takeaways. They're more lessons learned rather than here's how we did it, because I think there's pretty much a prescribed how does everybody do it at this point. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna ask EVM questions. So first question is to uh, Brittany. So you said you, uh, when you measure your progress, you are using the count of the JIRA stories, the completed JIRA stories. That's for the percent complete, right, tracking? Yeah, we're using um, the tasks. We don't do story points, but yeah, we do the WBS tasks okay. and count them. So is that based on the assumption that you've already um, split up your tasks to almost equal size of the effort? Yeah, so this I did not get to, but was on my slide. This was a lessons learned. So I would say most of our tasks were really appropriately defined. Um, and so it made, like, the end dates were defined, the scope was, it was great. But there were some that were not. <laughs> and so that ended up 
uh, creating some complexity in reporting because, especially with ongoing tasks, um, it's like, well, how do you say whether you've done something when it when it's you know leadership team meetings and it's basically for the whole scope of the project mm -hmm. or something like that. And so what we ended up doing was uh, saying that for that quarter, because we report on a quarterly basis, if we felt like we accomplished what we wanted to do in that quarter, then we would count it as um, completed for that quarter. Mm -hmm. And so in the quarterly reporting, it would be marked as complete. But then for like the cumulative reporting, it was not. Um, and we had to define that within the report. And so that was actually a lesson learned um, that that piece didn't work. But for the most part, it did. Though There was only a couple ex exceptions of that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and my next question is for Jeanette, because you said define the value first and then measure against it. Are you talking about the cost tracking or the percent complete? Percent complete. Okay. That works because I was thinking you already defined the cost. <laughs> right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Sorry. value thank could you, be thank a you for deviation. That clarification. Okay. Oh. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Any questions for the panel? Anything on the app? Okay. I will. So if you want anything but EVM, what would you prefer? What kind of options would you like to see specified in the rig or elsewhere? Well, the idea that was proposed this morning <laughs> was very intriguing. Kind of moving more to, and I can't even, I'm, I'm not like pulling up the exact um, suggestion, but um, thank you, thank you. Yes, milestone execution. But I haven't, I haven't delved into it, so I don't know. So that's why we're sticking, we're, we're really making this work for what we have now, but it's got me thinking about next steps. Um, I should have probably mentioned in my presentation, we are using EVM, but I call it EVM Lite. Uh, we, only do, we don't do the rigorous version that I've seen in uh, the defense industry or large scale projects. We track uh, on a level two basis planned value, actual, and earned value. And what helped us in the earned value section is um, that uh, those three elements basically have the same unit. Because usually when you say you track a uh, planned value, parentheses, budget, and uh, actual value cost, you're tracking your spending. And then all of a sudden the performance was in percent. So this way it allowed us actually to compare uh, that we are actually under budget, but not just not because we uh, are cheaper, but we just didn't achieve what we needed to achieve. Or we had moments in our project where we were over the planned value, but if we were over the planned value, we actually uh, were ahead of certain elements. So it was not just a pure spending would not have revealed that. And those things is what we focused on. And I have to admit the rest we just ignored. That's what we use on EBM, and that has been, quite honestly, quite helpful for us. So I call it EVM light to answer your question. <laughs> level, two. level two basis only, yes. Sorry, I, I have a quick question about the MSRI one. I think, Carrie, are you the only person with the MS? Ah, uh, okay, Thank you. both of you. So I'm curious about what the deliverable is? Is it like a technical design report? Is it, you, you said you wanted to be up to being able to do a preliminary design, but what exactly is the deliverable as expressed in the, in the PEP? Well, okay, so from our perspective, you know, the letter of the rig says that mid-scale one ends at an implementation-ready design. You know, if in, and anybody has their own interpretation of what implementation-ready. I think we heard this morning from Matt Hawkins, implementation-ready is ready for construction. And I think that can be the prevailing attitude. We decided within our project that rather than approach it that way, because we have a lot of unknowns about where we go with our design at the end. We're not there yet. We're so early in the project. We're a year and a half into four years. So we don't really know that yet. So we've chosen 
to redefine that as the design package, i.e. drawings, uh, technical reports, cost estimates, schedule basis, et cetera, for a PDR level um, review. And that that's just what we decided to tailor it to. And uh, I can add to this, uh, our project in our uh, PEP, we defined a scope. We have a minimum scope of what we need to achieve. Uh, for us, it's of maybe a little bit easier because these are simply measurements and simply uh, certain elements in our design that we have to achieve and we have what the optimal scope. And those uh, in our commissioning process and qualification process, we literally have a checklist of all the scope elements, what have we achieved and what is still outstanding and we are tracking what's the plan, when will we have it. At what level? Level two. It is PDR, yes. All right, everybody, that wraps up this panel. Um, just a reminder, we're going to be in this room tomorrow for all the mid-scale track sessions that are happening. Uh, if you do have any other questions for the, the folks up front, you can add them in the Whova app, and we can answer them at a, later on. Okay, any admin announcements? No, I think, I don't think so. Tomorrow, 8 a.m.? Okay, perfect. So tomorrow we're gonna continue our discussions with uh, Mark Warner and Carol Wilkinson. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.